West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com So, uh, we got Frank here, so it's good. I wanted, hey, Frank, you know, I went to law school. I'm a country lawyer. <laughs> oh, so it's going to start this I really way? don't understand these strange words that you all jumble together, but I'd like to read a couple, uh, a couple of federal criminal statutes because I think it's a good place to start this show because I think with all of the ground noise that's going on, all of all of the questions about who voted what way. I, I think we're missing the bigger picture. And I want federal authorities to know that the people of the United States of America are going to pressure them every day to hold these traitors, to hold these seditionists uh, to the full extent of the law. And I understand there are a lot of people out there who call themselves evangelicals that no longer believe in the word of God that now worship false idols, that haven't read the New Testament, haven't read the Gospels. That's fine. That's between you and Jesus, okay? That's between you and Jesus. But when you storm the Capitol, that's between the federal government and, and you. And we are the people. We are the people. You're, you, you tried to take over our house. You trashed our house. You beat up our police officers. You tried to kill our speaker. You tried to kill our vice president. You are going to be held accountable. And then maybe when you're in jail for a long time, maybe somebody can slip you a Bible and you can start reading the Gospels again. And maybe even read some of the Old Testament about what happens to nations when they worship false idols. So with that as a backdrop... Mm. Good morning, everyone. Section 2384, seditious conspiracy. And stop me if this doesn't apply. Keep the picture. Well, there you go. There you go. If two or more persons in any state or territory or in any place subject to the jurisdiction of the United States conspire to overthrow, put down, or to destroy by force the government of the United States, or to levy war against them, or to oppose by force the authority thereof, or to force to prevent, hinder, or delay the execution of any law of the United States, or by force to seize, take, or possess any property of the United States, contrary to the authority thereof, they shall each be fined not more than 5,000, and imprisoned not more than six years. There are others that actually were updated. I get it. That's a 1948. Uh, this one said that's not more than 20 years or both. Uh, now, of course, it was updated in 1994, and it updated it, Frank, to 20 years. And so, Frank, um, you look at the language. Let's put it up one more time. 
You look at the language, Frank, and you tell me how these people who were breaking into the Capitol, who are now whimpering and whining when they're being taken off of airplanes, they don't understand that they've committed treason against the United States of America, that they are involved in a seditious conspiracy by force, hinder, delay, the execution of any law of the United States. But, Frank, that's the thing. This wasn't just any law. This was actually one of the cornerstones of the United States Constitution. This was the part of the Constitution that separated us from every other country in the world. Mm. John Adams did it first in 1800 when he voluntarily walked away from the presidency. After he lost, he didn't seize power. It shocked countries across the world that this grand new constitutional republic would have a peaceful transfer of power. And so there it was written in the United States Constitution to guarantee that peaceful transfer of power. And this was the day that the Constitution set that our representatives, our elected representatives, were to count the electoral votes as required by the Constitution of the United States. And those people on those scre- and on the screen, I'm sorry, I'm a simple country lawyer, but even I can figure out that is a conspiracy to commit sedition against the United States of America. Please tell me where I'm wrong, and please tell me if I am not wrong, why the hell? These people shouldn't be charged by federal prosecutors to the fullest extent of the law and be sent to prison for 20 years. It is Tuesday, the 12th of January of 2021, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, a small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. Yes, it always has and it always will, historically speaking. Well, the uh, resonance of the insurrection from last Wednesday still resonates. Uh, lots of prevarications, lots of, oh, why can't we just let bygones be bygones? Uh-huh, reality winner is still in jail, I want you to know. Okay. Why is she in jail? Well, she divulged the fact that the Russians hacked our election in 2016. Trump couldn't stand that, so they threw her in jail, threw away the key. But people storming the Capitol with the intent to murder our electeds, including the vice president. Uh, is well, just, a, it's a trifle. It's just free speech. Uh, you know, you said that uh, Hillary was asleep for, what, six hours during Benghazi, which she wasn't. That's an absolute lie. And Trump took six hours to, you know, make a statement about, oh, we love you. Would you just please stop? Please stop. But we love what you're doing. So what did, did the insurgents hear that and go, you know, he loves us and he loves what we're doing. Let's keep doing what we're doing. He said to stop, but I think he meant to stop, uh, you know, thinking about it. Just do it. <laughs> if you have to think, you're already behind. Just do it. And yeah, you know, there are people there who said, oh, you know, I, I was just caught up in the moment. Well, you know what? <laughs> That's what a mob is. That's why you don't want to become part of a mob, because it becomes its own amorphous entity with a seemingly intelligence of its own, a volition that moves it forward as if it is a thinking entity. You don't want to become part of that, <laughs> because when you do, you are culpable. You are aiding and, unbet- and abetting an insurgency. You are culpable for being a participant, an accomplice to murder of a cop. That's how the law is now. Just want you to know. Four people in a car, one shoots out the car, kills a cop. Everybody gets charged with murder. Just saying. I know that you don't like being treated like black people now. I heard that many times with people taken down by the cops when they were finally able to take people down. 
The constant cry from these white supremacists is, is, wait, you're supposed to be on our side. You're treating me like a black. Sometimes it was a little bit more uh, of a directed insult with the N-word, but I heard you're treating me like a black. People whining after being taken off of planes or out of uh, or taken into custody at airports because they're on the no-fly list because they're terrorists and they're crying, I'm not a terrorist. I was just in a crowd of a mob trying to kill our electeds. I'm not a terrorist. Yes, you are. Caught up in the moment is no excuse. Oh, you're just a good German, I know. All the good Germans were good Germans and none of them were culpable. Damn, they were. Every single one. Ignorance is bliss, but really, I got to tell you, before Trump... Ignorance was no excuse. <laughs> now it's a benefit, apparently. If you're not ignorant, they don't want you. This nation exists because of an informed public, and we saw exactly what went on. In real time, they can lie to us and gaslight us, but I think the vast majority of people, well, I know, and that is emblematic to, well, let's use the airplanes and airport uh, uh, examples. When people were dragged off the planes by law enforcement, dragged out of the airports by law enforcement, were people saying, don't do that. They're just they're, they're, they're exercising their constitutional right to overthrow the government. No, they said, get the hell out, you traitor. Get off the plane, you seditious mofo. People are fed up with these bullies. They're monster trucks, ISIS caravans, and yeah. Now we're supposed to just stand by and not do anything because they threatened all 50 state capitals. Well, you know what? Don't negotiate with terrorists. Do not give in to terrorists. You take the terrorists down. Oh, there's so many of them. So what? So effing what? If they can stop six Quakers before a demonstration, just for merely planning a demonstration, what was that demonstration? Oh, they're going to protest a nuke train. Not stop it. Stand by the tracks with signs busted them and threw them in jail for national security reasons. If they can do that, they can get these numerous cells of right-wing white nationalist insurgents and throw them in jail, hold them. Is 15,000 National Guardsmen enough? Have they been vetted? They're bringing in a lot of military types. Have they been vetted? Hopefully none of these National Guardsmen are in the Air Force or have been in the Air Force because apparently the Air Force has been pumping out a lot of weird white nationalists who want sedition and overthrow the government. What's up with that? Why is the Air Force seemingly that way? Well, there's some articles written about that. I should have put them in the links, but oops. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing, we've been told. Mm -hmm. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Well, it looks like if they can't kill you with guns and, and uh, flagpoles and hockey sticks and bats and fire extinguishers, they're going to breathe on you and kill you with COVID on the inside. Yeah, Representative Jemiah Paul has COVID now. Along, with, I can't remember the first woman from the East Coast. I think it was New Hampshire. I'm sorry, but... But two Democrats now have tested positive from COVID for being in a room of 100 people and the Democratic people staff wore masks. But some idiot Republicans laughed and mocked people wearing masks in an enclosed room for hours and hours when we know that in an enclosed room, and especially one with little to no ventilation like the room they were all in, if you're standing six feet away, it doesn't matter. It takes less than six minutes 
for the virus to well, saturate the room. So was that on purpose? Because, you know, they've been uh, on record saying that they want herd immunity. And the only way to do that is to get people infected. Don't wear a mask. Infect the general population. Then we'll have herd immunity, whether they like it or not. Yeah, people dying a horrible death isn't very, I don't think they like it. I would charge these mofos with assault at least. Attempted murder. Is there attempted manslaughter? I don't think there is. I got to look up the statute. But attempted murder. They laughed and mocked the Democratic representatives who are handing out masks as a goodwill gesture. I want those names and I want them on record. I want them on record. I want their names on record. And yes, the proper punishment should be levied. Who does that? Well, I would like to see a judge doing that. And I don't mean I, I, to belittle Nancy Pelosi's uh, power in this. They are criminals. This is not a violation of House rules. These are criminals. You know, people are still going to jail now for purposefully infecting other people with AIDS. Why is this any different? Oh, because they're Republicans, and it's okay if you're a Republican. Oh, well, you know, we I know we got caught trying to overthrow the government, but it's okay. We're Republicans. Can't we just have unity? You trying to hold us to account as dividing this nation. <laughs> Our attempt to to destroy this government was just to bring everybody together. Can't you see that? No, we don't. Maybe your constituency is able to put those connections together, but that's because of, uh, I think, uh, a, a, shall we say, diminished capacity of critical thinking. Yeah, is it is it from some sort of substance abuse? I don't know. <laughs> Well, what's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? You know, I've been going on with these opening rants uh, quite long lately, haven't I? Well, you know, the 21st is next week and we can't get there soon enough. No, we can't. Boy. And even then, before we get into what's uh, what else is on the menu here, let me just mention... Uh, one more time, because I don't think I've mentioned it enough, at least on the show. I've, I've mentioned it quite a bit on social media. I've been saying this for weeks, that I fear that Trump is going to pull a Sadat on Inauguration Day. And what is pulling a Sadat? Well, that was when Sadat was killed. Yeah, viewing a military parade. And suddenly the military turned on him. Has the National Guard, those 15,000 and, and possibly more National Guard, been vetted? Because I think we need to scrub law enforcement and military of anybody with white nationalist seditious tendencies. They cannot be in those positions anymore. No. <laughs> no. Why is that so hard to understand? Well, I guess it's hard for them to understand. Because they got caught thinking that it was all okay and they'd get away with it. Well, they're not. Okay, what's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, at the top, that was uh, that was Joe. Yeah, he was going off on his rant, too. Never let Frank Laguzzi, Fl Laguzzi say one word. What? Come on, Joe. Anyway... Seditious conspiracy is one of the many federal criminal statutes that could apply to the insurrection. I think could, is, better be, <laughs> on the rest of the menu. Michigan has banned the open carry of guns inside the Capitol, and not a moment too soon. You know, they wanted to decapitate their governor <laughs> until they got caught. And then the ones who didn't get caught went to D.C. to decapitate some electeds there. It's all okay. They're doing it for the Republicans. The Mississippi governor signed a law to fly the state flag without the rebel battle emblem. Boy, that's going to cause a lot of consternation among the secessionists. And the FBI is probing a Russian-linked postcard 
sent to the FireEye CEO after the cybersecurity firm uncovered the wide-ranging Russian hack. They won't say what substance was on that postcard. Oh, really? One of those convenient polonium poisonings or other use of agents of poisoning that the Russians like to use? One of those convenient postcards? We'll find out later, I guess. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the Trump administration's out-the-door decision to designate, designate Yemen's rebels as a terror organization has raised famine concerns. Yeah, there's uh there's NGOs trying to stop a famine right now and this is this designation is not helping. And Secretary General Antonio Guterres declared he is seeking a second term at the helm of the United Nations. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Radio.com. To the right of the page is our chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln because chat rooms need to be monitored, you know. Thank you, Kelly, for doing that and so much more. To the left of the chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at NetRootsRadio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And that's there because we collect money. And why do we collect money? Because we have to pay our bills. And uh, though a lot of how we do that comes out of our own wallets, and Tom will tell you that in just a moment, uh, we still need help from folks like you. And many of you have been very generous over these many, many years and, in fact, increased their contribution in this time of peril. <laughs> I can't tell you how much that has helped because the bills keep going up. And you know what? The last time we bought machinery to uh, be the workhorses to make this little powerhouse of resistance broadcast, uh, it was kind of expensive, and it's even it's even more expensive now. How dare they? And we're still uh, collecting the needed machinery and the attendant software in which to be able to, well, put some of these workhorses out to pasture and let them not work so hard. They've been working pretty darn hard for over four years of this 10-year run. In fact, we're still on Windows 7 on the PC. Uh Uh-huh. The MacBook has battery expansion, and it's still running like a champ. Oops, I hope we don't have a fire. (laughs) Anyway, thank you for your abundant generosity. It has come in very helpful. Now, for those of you who would consider maybe uh, joining the team, uh, if you could afford uh, an espresso-type coffee drink and uh, send those funds to us once once a month, we stretch those dollars beyond compare because we're quantum mechanics when it comes to stretching dollars right down to, well, the quantum level. I don't know how we do it. It's neither waves nor particles, maybe waves. Maybe it's more like waves. Or is it pockets of energy? That's what it is. Packets of energy now. And we're able to stretch those packets of energy. Wow. We leave no strange quark unturned. Anyway, we pay our bills. uh, Fly under the radar. Continue resisting because it looks like the white nationalist Nazis are going to be around for a while. And uh, when we keep resisting and broadcasting... As the founders originally intended, oh, so many years ago. Okay, thank you for your generosity. Enough of the joking. Uh, We pay our bills, and it's really because of your help. Thank you. All right, if you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and he does a lot more, too, like graphic design and all that other stuff. Thank you, Tom. 
And you can follow me on Twitter, and I would suggest you do because I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Kos about 10 minutes before showtime and then post that on Twitter at Justice Putnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, pick up those show notes and links diaries, and that's where all the show notes and links are. All right. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and please pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. And if uh, there are, are any reviews, if you could like, you know, review it, it just pushes the, uh, the thing up in the, in the search engine. That's what they say. So thank you for all of that. All right. Let's tuck in to this first offering here. In the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, it's by Anna Liz Nichols out of the Associated Press. A state panel yesterday, Monday, banned the open carry of guns in Michigan's capital a week after an armed mob rioted in the U.S. Capitol and following a plot last year to storm the state house and capture electeds put uh, Whitmer under trial in some sort of kangaroo court in the woods and then decapitate her. Don't call him ISIS, though. Moves to ban weapons at the state house have been pushed since April when protesters opposed to Governor Gretchen Whitmer's COVID-19 restrictions, some armed with long rifles and other weapons like machetes, entered the Michigan Capitol demanding to be allowed onto the floor of a legislative chamber that was closed to the public. The Michigan State Capitol Commission, which is responsible for overseeing the Capitol, had been reluctant to issue rules for firearms, but it shifted course Monday and issued the order to ban the open carrying of weapons, and that be Monday being yesterday. A spokesman for Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky, who previously said the commission should not be responsible for creating gun policies, said last week that he would support an open carry ban after violence erupted at the U.S. Capitol by a mob of Donald Trump supporters. A spokeswoman for incoming House Speaker Jason Wentworth said he wants everyone to abide by the rule even though he doesn't believe the commission had the right to issue it. The speaker is grateful for the work of the Capitol Commission, but does not have the authority to set policy in the Capitol, a news release said. The speaker will be looking at options for handling that moving forward. In the meantime, the Michigan State Police will be enforcing the new ruling. Wow, that's trying to have it both ways, huh? 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 Commission Vice Chair John Truscott said the commission does not write policy but is ready to address general security issues. He said state government will have to fund it. We don't have a budget for security measures, so in reality, the governor and legislature would have to deal with it, Truscott said. We've gone as far as we can go with the budget constraints we have. Some of the anti-government extremists accused in the plot to kidnap Whitmer had carried guns at lockdown protests at the Capitol last spring. Prosecutors say the accused ringleader initially talked of recru recruiting 200 men to storm the building, take hostages, and execute tyrants. A secondary plan involved locking exits and setting the State House on fire according to court documents. The FBI has warned for of plans for armed protests at all state capitals and in Washington, D.C. in the days leading up to President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration. Michigan State Police will increase its visible and unseen presence at the Capitol for the next couple of weeks, spokeswoman Sharon Banner said in an email yesterday, Monday. The Michigan Democratic Party issued a statement saying that though it applauds the fact the commission has, quote, finally put their authority to use, end quote, it is not enough and that all firearms should be banned inside the Capitol.
Waxer Pettis of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Mississippi hoisted a new state flag without the Confederate battle emblem yesterday, Monday, just over six months after legislators retired the last state banner in the U.S. that included the divisive rebel symbol. The new flag has a magnolia and the phrase, in God we trust. Voters approved the design in November, and Governor Tate Reeves signed a law on Monday to make it an official state symbol. A new chapter in our history begins today. One of the leaders in changing the flag, Republican House Speaker Philip Gunn, told more than 100 people who gathered in near-freezing weather, climate change, to watch the new flag being raised outside the new outside the state capitol. Just before signing the law, Reeve said the old flag with the Confederate symbol was a prominent roadblock to unity. The Confederate battle emblem, a red field topped by a blue wax with 13 white stars, was put on the upper left corner of the Mississippi flag in 1894 by white supremacists in the state legislature, a generation after the South lost the Civil War. The flag was part of the backlash against political power that black people had attained during Reconstruction. Critics had long said the flag was a racist symbol that failed to represent a state with the largest percentage of black residents in the nation. The Ku Klux Klan and other hate groups have waved the Confederate battle flag for decades. Georgia put the battle emblem prominently on its state flag in 1956 during a backlash to the civil rights movement, and that state removed the symbol from its banner in 2001. Being of Reuters brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The FBI is investigating a mysterious postcard sent to the home of cybersecurity firm FireEye's chief executive days after it found initial evidence of a suspected Russian hacking operation on dozens of U.S. government agencies and private American companies. U.S. officials familiar with the postcard are investigating whether it was sent by people associated with a Russian intelligence service due to its timing and content, which suggests internal knowledge of last year's hack well before it was publicly disclosed in December. Wow. Moscow, of course, has denied involvement in the hack, which U.S. intelligence agencies publicly attributed to Russian state actors. The postcard carries FireEye's logo, is addressed to CEO Kevin Mandia, and calls into question the ability of the Milipedes, California-based firm to accurately attribute cyber operations to the Russian government. People familiar with Mandia's postcard summarized its content to Reuters. It shows a cartoon with the text, Hey, look, Russians! And Putin did it. The opaque message itself did not help Fire Eye find the breach, but rather arrived in the early stages of its investigation. This has led people familiar with the matter to believe the sender was attempting to troll or push the company off the trail by intimidating a senior executive. They had not disclosed publicly that they had discovered this hack yet. 
They were still investigating. And then someone sends them a postcard. It's not the Russians. Because Putin did it. Uh Uh-huh. Reuters could not determine who sent the postcard. U.S. law enforcement and intelligence agencies are spearheading the probe into its origin, the source familiar said. The FBI did not provide comment. A fire eye representative declined to discuss the postcard. Now, I still have a question. I, apparently, I guess it didn't have any polonium on it or any other nerve agent that might, uh, you know, poison someone conveniently since Russia likes to do that. Because I think maybe that might come later. Well, maybe. FireEye discovered the Russian hacking campaign, now known as SolaraGate, for how it leveraged supply chain vulnerabilities in network management firm SolarWinds because of an anomalous device login from within FireEye's network. The odd login triggered a security alert and subsequent investigation, which led to the discovery of the Russia operation. FireEye worked closely with Microsoft to determine that the infiltration at FireEye in fact represented a hacking campaign that struck at least eight federal agencies, including the Treasury, State, and Commerce Departments. When the postcard was sent, FireEye had not yet determined who was behind the cyber attack. A person familiar with the postcard investigation said, This is not typically the Russian SVR's playbook, but times are rapidly changing. SVR is an acronym for the Foreign Intelligence Service of Russia. A former U.S. intelligence official said the postcard reminded him of a now public mission by U.S. Cyber Command, where they sent private messages to Russian hackers ahead of the 2018 congressional elections in the U.S., The message then from the U.S. was, watch your back, we see you, similar to here, the former official said. The extent of damages tied to the U.S. government hack remains unclear. Emails belonging to senior officials were stolen from an unclassified network at the Treasury and Commerce Departments. Oh, what about Hillary's emails, though? Let's go to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Jason Goldman. The cheetah is the rarest big cat in Africa. Less than 7,000 adults remain on the planet. Think of it this way. For every cheetah on the planet, there's more than four Starbucks coffee shops. The most important cheetah stronghold is in central Namibia. But the cheetahs there don't live within national parks. They live on privately owned farmland. There were farmers having huge problems with cheetahs, losing a lot of livestock. And there were other farmers who actually didn't have any problem at all. Ecologist Jörg Melsheimer from the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research in Berlin, assumed at first that all farmers had cheetah trouble. It was just that some were more likely to complain about it. But after tracking 50 collared cheetahs, he began to suspect that there really was a pattern to their killing. By the time his team had data from 106 cheetahs collared over the course of a decade, not only was he certain that cheetahs were more likely to kill in some places than in others, but that he could solve the problem. We indeed found these communication hubs of cheetahs, which are spread evenly across the landscape um, with a high activity of cheetahs within the hubs. Cheetahs are an asocial species, but they still need to trade information. They don't meet physically, typically not, um, but they leave marks at prominent landmarks um, where they um, either use urine or feces to communicate with each other. Think of it as a coffee shop for cats, where animals trade gossip. 
Even though these communication hubs only comprise around 10% of the landscape, cheetahs spend most, sometimes all, of their time within them. This is basically a long-term tradition, which is uh, passed on from cheetah generation to cheetah generation. Um, some of these communication hubs are basically known, or let's say the marking locations, the marking trees were known by farmers for 60, 70 years. Like the, the grandfather of the current farmer already knew the marking trees in this area. What the farmers never realized is that only some farms overlap with the cheetah's communication hubs. Melsheimer thought that if those farmers relocated their most vulnerable herds, it could be a huge help. He remembers the first farmer he tried to convince. And I told him, look, Wilfried, I have, I have the idea that they are actually there because of these marking trees. And, and you happen to have your small calves exactly in the same area. Let's try to move your herds out of this area. And, uh, and, and keep them somewhere else. And then let's measure the losses. And he was laughing at me. He said, yeah, okay, nice idea, but I'm not sure whether this is going to work. They will probably follow the cast. So um, we tried this and actually it worked. And he, he, he earned much more money because he lost less calves. After that, 35 more farmers agreed to try it out. In all, the number of calves lost to cheetah predation fell by a whopping 86%. Of course, some cattle outside of communication hubs were still lost to cheetahs, but it was at a low enough level that most farmers seemed to tolerate it. What this means is that cheetahs aren't actively following the cattle. They simply take advantage of whatever food is available nearby. If it's not cattle, then they go after wild ungulates like springbok or oryx or kudu. There are no so-called problem cheetahs who intentionally seek out cattle. Instead, there are problem areas. That's a much easier problem to solve, and it's one that doesn't result in farmers killing cheetahs. Melsheimer is now hard at work collecting tracking data from cheetahs in other parts of Africa to see whether his findings hold up in other ecosystems. So often it seems as if the goals of wildlife conservation are incompatible with the goals of commerce. But this story reveals that, in fact, biodiversity and agriculture can coexist. Our case is really one of these uh, nice examples where it can go hand in hand. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When it snows this winter, make sure you clear more than your driveway. Before you hit the road and before you get in the driver's seat, Check to be sure that your vehicle's tailpipe is clear of snow. If the tailpipe is blocked, carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless, and deadly gas produced by your engine, can build up quickly inside your vehicle, poisoning anyone inside. To learn more, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. That's 1-800-232-4636. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. In 2012 in the United States, about 317,000 motor vehicle crashes involved a large truck. 26,000 truck drivers and their passengers were injured in these crashes, and about 700 died. Trucker safety requires an alert, buckled-up experienced driver with a reliable vehicle and a strong employer safety program. Seat belts are the most effective way to prevent an injury or death in a motor vehicle crash, but in 2013, one in six drivers of large trucks didn't use their seat belts. Employers can help truck drivers stay safe by committing to driver safety programs at the highest level of leadership, establishing and enforcing driver safety policies, including requiring everyone in the truck to buckle up, and addressing factors that contribute to crashes, such as drowsy and distracted driving. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? 
That's all we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondrous pair of Netroots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Before a person becomes president, is he required to swear a specific oath on a Bible? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. The Constitution requires a person who is about to become president to take this oath. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The oath is secular. It is consistent with the Founders' belief embodied in the First Amendment of a wall of separation between church and state, and is consistent as well with the no-religious test provision in the Constitution. That says no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust. Contrary to public belief, the presidential oath of office does not end with the word, so help me God. And there's no requirement that the president place his hand on a Bible or any other religious book. And although the historical record is not absolutely clear, some presidents most likely have taken the oath without a Bible. John Quincy Adams, for example, wrote in his diary that when he took the oath of office in 1825, he swore on a, quote, volume of laws. All that having been said, nothing in the Constitution prohibits the president-to-be from taking the oath with his hand on a Bible or adding the words, so help me God. So, in this instance, as with many others, the Constitution allows the individual to follow his conscience, to make an individual choice. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. What's wrong with people? Has the savagery and raw animal hatred within the human species finally come out of the darkness to devour our society? Fanatics in MAGA caps, rabidly cheering a tyrannical, lying, insane president. Gangs of proud boys beating protesters whose politics they dislike. Wackadoodle extremists promoting the group hallucination that Nancy Pelosi is leading a fiendish democratic cabal of child sex traffickers. But is that really who we are? Given the media and political focus on all things awful about people, you would think so. But consider a couple of little-discussed truths about humanity that might help all of us step back from hopelessness and push ahead in our political work with a fresh perspective on what is possible. Warning, these truths are so contrary to present-day conventional thinking of what is possible that when some people are first exposed, their brains whiplash. So brace yourself, here goes. Truth number one. Most people are fundamentally fair-minded, kind, and generous. Truth number two, the basic human instinct is not dog-eat-dog selfishness, but social cooperation and sharing. You might holler in disbelief, how can such happy truths jibe with that litany of horrors we are experiencing? Well, although there are obvious exceptions to the rule, decades of behavioral studies have by and large produced the same finding. The great majority of people are guided in their daily actions and relations by deep values of fairness and sharing. This is Jim Hightower saying, It turns out that humankind is, well, overwhelmingly kind. That's the deep, promising virtue that we should highlight, making people's innate desire for an equitable, cooperative society the basis for every one of our economic, political, and social policies. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. I'm Rick Smith. 
And this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1942. That was the day that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt established the National War Labor Board under Executive Order 9017. The board was designed to mediate and settle disputes in the various defense industries. Its purpose was to prevent any strikes or lockouts that would interfere with war production. The War Labor Board consisted of 12 representatives, four each from industry, labor, and the public. It established procedures for dispute resolution and detailed the scope of grievances, arbitration, and award enforcement. The board had the authority to issue binding agreements and to recommend government seizures of plants involved in work stoppages. It instituted the Little Steel formula to allow for cost of living increases in an effort to stem inflation. In exchange for the no-strike pledge, it instituted maintenance of membership in unionized workplaces, which made union membership automatic for new hires and mandated employer collection of union dues. During the war, it imposed tens of thousands of wage dispute settlements and wage agreements. In a 1942 case against General Motors, the board mandated equal pay for equal work for women and minorities. Those critical of the board opposed the no-strike pledge and compulsory arbitration as clampdowns on labor's power and independence. They argued it was stacked with open shop advocates, enforced wage controls and freezes, and encumbered workers with endless red tape, runarounds, and delays in resolutions. Labor historian Steve Frazier notes that after the 1942 elections, pro-business appointees made union organizing efforts throughout the South and in the retail and service sectors difficult. The board ceased its functions at the end of 1935 though it set precedents for arbitration that are still in use today. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin, whether from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 44 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high about 51 to 52, with copious amounts of rain falling as it is right now. And we're expecting heavy rainfall later. It's not so heavy at the moment. About an inch and a half we're supposed to have. We were supposed to get about a quarter of an inch overnight. I don't know if we got that much, but we are expected, and it looks like just from the radar from the satellite imagery that uh, we're in for it. And then uh, cloudy with periods of rain overnight, lows in the upper 40s with heavy rainfall, about a half an inch overnight. Winds will be out of the southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. They are currently light and variable. And then showers in the morning tomorrow with highs in the mid-50s, then partly cloudy in the afternoon, winds light and variable, expecting tomorrow, oh, about a tenth of an inch or maybe more. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of southern Oregon. Uh Uh-huh. Actually, I think we're more in the northern part of Southern Oregon in terms of the Jackson County County area that I reside in. Well, those confirmed cases have been updated from the weekend totals and have now really spiked to 6,563. We went from 71 dead to now 80. Those are updated totals. Those are not one-day totals. They are terrible totals nonetheless. 
Looks like pollen is rated at none right here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 30 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is low at 2. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.01 inches. Visibility is down to 2.3 miles, and relative humidity is at 100%. We're almost swimming. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 42 and partly cloudy. Paris is 50 degrees with rain. Rome is 50 degrees and sunny. Kiev is 30 degrees and cloudy. Kabul is 37 with smoke. Because it's winter time, they're cold, they are burning wood to keep warm. Looks like Hong Kong is 45 and clear, Tokyo is 37 and fair, Sydney, Australia is 73 degrees and clear, San Francisco, California is 50 degrees and mostly cloudy with a fog warning, and New York, New York is a crisp 39 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. Maggie Michelle and Sammy Magdi of the Associated Press bring us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Trump administration's out the door decision to designate Yemen's Iranian backed rebels as a terror organization sparked confusion in aid agencies and warnings from the UN and senior Republicans yesterday, Monday, that it could have a devastating humanitarian impact on a conflict-wracked nation facing the risk of famine. The designation is to take effect on Trump's last full day in office because he likes to poke everybody in the eye. He's an insurgent, a seditious, treasonous mofo, and why is anybody letting him get away with this? Well, they're not, are they? And uh, that's supposed to be on January 20th, you know, next week. Several aid groups pleaded for Biden to immediately reverse the designation, with Oxfam's America's humanitarian policy lead Scott Paul saying, lives hang in the ballot. The Biden transition team has not yet expressed his intentions, but I think we know where it is. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Edith M. Letterer of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Secretary General Antonio Guterres officially declared Monday, yesterday, he is seeking a second five-year term at the helm of the United Nations. 
Guterres, whose current term ends next December 31st, said in a letter to General Assembly President Volkan Bozker that it would be my honor to continue to serve the organization in pursuing its purposes and fulfilling its noble objectives. The former Portuguese Prime Minister and UN Refugee Chief was elected by the 193-member Assembly to, ex- to succeed Ban Ki-moon, after a hotly contested and transparent race in October of 2016 that initially included 13 candidates, 7 women, and 6 men. Guterres took office on January 1st of 2017. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on. And, of course, we're going to meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Boom. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver